Hello. We have a fantastic guest. Um, specifically, uh, about two years ago when the pandemic started, we all started showing up on LinkedIn um, in, in an increasing rate and sharing content. And it's been wonderful to experiment and have communications and see uh, what kind of content resonates and uh, what kind of conversations um, actually result in great conversations and maybe professional contacts and opportunity. Um, and so I've been very interested to figure out uh, how to have those virtual conversations uh, in a way that is one, satisfying personally, but two, uh, also helpful professionally. Um, the term storytelling comes up many times. It is used in many, many contexts from sales to marketing to personal brand. And so I was very interested to have a conversation about storytelling, effective storytelling with somebody who has given it a deep thought. Jay, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Olga. It's great to be here. Um, and great to be here uh, with you all who have joined us. Uh, I'm Jay Harrington. And I am a, an attorney, although I no longer practice. Uh, I started my legal career um, practicing corporate restructuring law at Skadden Arps in Chicago, went on to Foley and Lardner, and then uh, founded my own small firm, uh, ran that for a few years. And then now, uh, since then, I'm about uh, a little over a decade, I've been doing consulting work, um, working with those in the legal industry to help improve their thought leadership marketing, and um, just general legal marketing in particular. So um, that's who I am, and uh, I am glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Um, I love your content on LinkedIn, and I I, I read it, and I, I, I do my best interacting, and um, both with folks who are um, kind of part of it and, and yourself. I learned quite a lot from you. Before we get into the substance of storytelling, which I think is is very critical part of thought leadership, um, are you still practicing law? Are you, or is that kind of the 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 past that 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 you left behind? Yeah, um, it's the past I left behind. I am still licensed to practice, but um, I don't have any intention of going back. Uh, <laughs> I it's not that I disliked practicing law, but I had kind of an entrepreneurial itch that I felt like um, I wanted to pursue in the legal marketing space, and I found that this career gave me a little bit more flexibility to. For example, live where I want. This is pre-pandemic. Now it might be a little different, but um, I don't. I don't practice any longer. Um, but it's nice because I'm sort of adjacent to the legal industry in the sense that, you know, 95% of the folks I work with are either lawyers or um, legal marketing professionals. For example, so I still feel immersed in the community. But I'm not. Um, I'm still billing hours, but just of a different variety. Uh, you, know? you can get the boy out of law, but not law out of the boy. Um, you talked. To, you just mentioned thought leadership. Mm -hmm. um, that that's the term that gets thrown around a lot, um, and uh, it means all kinds of things to all kinds of people. Well, what does it mean to you? Well, I think it it helps to talk about it, um, sort of to draw a distinction from a marketing standpoint about you know the, the different ways that you can sort of gain attention for yourself, your brand, your firm, your company. Um, you know, there's one way is to kind of buy attention, right? That would be things like traditional advertising, where you're paying a gatekeeper to get your message out. And on the other end of the spectrum is earning attention, um, and that's through things like thought leadership, meaning. Um, taking your expertise, packaging it into different forms of content, whether that be written, audio, video, public speaking, and sharing those ideas generously and abundantly with, with the world, with the market that you're trying to attract uh, to whatever it is that your business goals are. So, um, you know, it is a bit, a bit of a, a word that sometimes, I don't know if it in, intimidates people, um, especially those who maybe are early on in their careers because they think, I'm not, you know, a uh, the foremost expert in my space yet. So what do I really have to say that might be of interest to people? Um, but it's really about sharing ideas that are reflective of the level of experience you have at the moment. We're all experts in something. We all have something interesting to say and we can package that into thought leadership content that other people can benefit from. Um, so the idea is instead of you know just going out and um, leading with facts and figures and features and accolades. It's really leading with ideas um, and becoming visible in the marketplace of ideas. Um, so I like that you identified three steps. The step one is to identify your expertise. The step two 
is to package it in step three that you share it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very useful framework, uh, and I love how you think about it. Um, before we get into storytelling, I want to tell you, you mentioned you work with, with attorneys and legal marketers. I specifically have a, a very warm place in my heart for in-house lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, when you're in-house, um, you don't have to actively go out and bring business. Uh, you, you know, business kind of comes to you and you actually kind of have the opposite problem of having a little too much of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you see in-house lawyers actively uh, building their thought leadership um, is, is, a, is a common um, and, it, and if yes, why yes and no, why no? Yeah, well, I think that um, a couple things, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think that it isn't all that common and I think that's unfortunate. Um, you, you know, you, on LinkedIn, for example, you see people like Lisa Lang and other in-house lawyers who are actively sharing thought leadership. Um, but probably, you know, the number of in-house lawyers, for example, um, or sorry, um, private practice lawyers probably outnumber the number of in-house lawyers who are creating content because private practice lawyers, to your point, Olga, are out there looking for and trying to drum up new business. Now, from an in-house perspective, um, I think that thought leadership is still extremely important because, one, I think we all need to think about our personal brands and making sure that we're visible. Um, you never know where the next opportunity might come from. Um, you as a person who has a strong personal brand can also be a, a strong advocate for your business, right? Everyone, every business has goals and objectives and in-house lawyers can be strong advocates for those positions. Um, and then I think also internally, Again, we're all trying to move things forward, um, impact, build a culture, impact people within the organization. You know, a, an in-house lawyer who's tasked with some aspects of risk mitigation um, needs to be a strong thought leader in order to embed that ethic within the organization. Um, so whatever you're trying to do that uh, involves persuasion, and that's the job of a lawyer, um, I think involves becoming competent and effective at taking a set of ideas and communicating that effectively to an audience, whether that be an external audience or an internal one. Yeah, I'm with you. For a while, you know, I, I, I spent most of my career in house. I was the one and only. Um, and uh, I worked with a number of lawyers who basically would tell me, Olga, we are in house lawyers. We, we don't tweet. We do not show up on LinkedIn. And my answer would be, well, you are that the kind of lawyer you are. That's not the kind of lawyer I am. Um, and I am with you that, um, you know, in the end, uh, we persuade. And sometimes it's, you know, you, you build that thought leadership internally, and that's effective. And actually, sometimes it's helpful to put pressure from outside in, as opposed to from inside out, mm -hmm. um, and establish your credentials through third parties, uh, platforms and, and, and consistency. Um, to 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 convey um, your expertise, um, I definitely think that it is still there. You know, Liz is one of them. There's a few other that I see now, especially in the pandemic, um, that either show up on LinkedIn or other um, media. Um, but it's still pretty rare. There are relatively few, um, and I do think that's an opportunity to lost and missed by many in house lawyers. Um, when I talk to you about the role of storytelling and importance of that in in the way you package and share your um, your ideas and 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 your expertise. Um, you know, storytelling is something that's been historically used. I don't know in from theater to Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily quite uh, an intuitive term. Although, if you talk to trial lawyers. They will tell you that you should take your 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 jury for uh, on the on the journey of a storytelling. So to some extent, has been used in the kind of more theatrical part of practice of law in the courtroom, but but definitely not something that is uh, commonly used um, historically and uh, in the context of managing brands. So what does storytelling mean in the context of thought leadership? So I think it it really gets down to understanding that you know there's kind of two approaches to take when it comes to persuasion, which again, thought leadership is all about. We're trying to persuade an audience one way or the other. Um, and one approach would be kind of using the traditional um, rhetorical devices of 
logic, reason, facts, and figures, uh, and that you know is is can be valuable. Um, but it also is the type of thing that results in boring PowerPoint slides and dry memos and advertising full of facts and figures and content with complex um, language and jargon. Um, and, and the other alternative, though, is is storytelling. And the reason storytelling is effective, it's not, and it, I should emphasize, Olga, it's not either or, um, sort of the traditional approach to um, you know logic and reason and storytelling, on the other hand, it's kind of a blending of both. And the reason storytelling is important, though, is that it's the thing that evokes emotion in people. And you know, there's scientific data that backs this up. And I think we all can sort of intuit this from our own behavior and the behavior we see from others is that um, emotion is what oftentimes drives decision making and action. So if we can marry those two concepts, it can become really powerful um, in order in order to help us persuade the audience that we're trying to reach. Um, so I think in that sense, story is a very important component of um, what we're doing. And, and you'll see if you look closely, um, it's not just something for Hollywood. Um, it's very much the type of um, messaging and branding and marketing and, and other forms of communication that some of the biggest brands in business uh, today utilize and leverage. Um, Apple is a great sort of iconic example of this. And Steve Jobs was known as sort of the ultimate storyteller in business. Um, today, we probably look at Elon Musk in a similar way, someone who started a company that was based on largely a story, right? He was raising money based on the notion of being able to build this new electric vehicle that was going to help solve climate change and transform transformation and uh, transportation in many different ways. And, and even today, Tesla is called sort of the ultimate story stock because by any historical metrics, its revenue doesn't support its multiple, but nonetheless, people believe in the story that he's telling. And as a result of that, there's so many people that are on board with that brand and invested in his vision and the company's vision that you know story has become their ultimate asset. And I think as individuals, um, we can do the same thing. If we if we think about you know any a professional services provider who's trying to build a book of business, we've all heard the old cliche that a client hires the lawyer, not the law firm and that a client needs to know, like, and trust the lawyer, well, trust might come from you know, demonstrating your expertise, but likability oftentimes comes from people understanding who you are as a person. And that comes from telling your story, right? We often think we need, think we need to be really buttoned up and at an arm's length with our clients or our audience, but the exact opposite is true. People connect with us as a result of hearing our story. And where do you find those opportunities to, to tell your story because when you actually, you know, say an outside lawyer giving legal advice or when you're in-house lawyer trying to influence the direction of your business, that may or may not be the time to tell kind of personal stories. Mm -hmm. What is the venue that is appropriate, you know, that you build trust so that eventually when the time comes for you to be of influence, you can have the outcome you desire? Well, I think there's there's many different ones. And again, it, it gets back to um, two questions, really. Um, what is your objective uh, in terms of what you're trying to communicate? And who is your audience? And I think once you understand those two things, then the stories that you tell and the way in which you tell those stories comes into clear view. Um, so, for example, it might be an instance where um, if you're someone who's working internally and you're speaking to um, people who are subordinates to you within a company, um, you are trying to build a culture and create behavior change. It's oftentimes effective to humanize yourself and talk about how you've struggled with that same issue that you're, you're hoping that they can then address and improve upon themselves as part of your career. And by telling that story, it helps resonate with them. Instead of talking at them, you're really becoming an ally who's talking with them. So that's one example. In another context, I think social media platforms are a great way to tell our stories. Um, LinkedIn in particular, even though it's a business-oriented platform, it's still a social platform. And I oftentimes, I have a couple of heuristics that I, that I like to share when we're thinking about like, all right, why do we tell stories on, in places like LinkedIn? Don't people just want to know what we know? And I think that's not the case. I think people are much more interested 
in or, or less interested in what we know sometimes than how we came to know it. They want to know sort of our story. And every good story involves some sort of struggle. Um, so that, that's one instance of that. And then another would be, um, you know, the example of you know, people just, uh, they don't necessarily care about where you're at now. They want to know, again, where you came from. So they like to hear your backstory. So I think social media is a great place to think about storytelling um, because the audience that is there is interested in getting to know the people in their network, not just as professionals, but also as people. Yeah. So if, if the goal is to, to be an expert, to be seen as one, um, unavoidably, we are in sort of thought leadership, leadership, um, shaping the perceptions um, of how we're viewed and how we're seen, right? There, it's two different things to be an expert and to be seen one. And ideally, you have both. Mm -hmm. um, really, you want to be married to the two, right? Mar mar marriage of the two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and having expertise is, you know, presumably table stakes. Uh, there, you know, I, I or you probably do not advocate just perceptions. Uh, but what we're talking about is once you have that expertise, how do you package it up uh, in the storytelling way uh, so that uh, you are also perceived as mm -hmm. an expert? Yeah. Um, how, how do you do that? And yeah. how do you make sure that the perception of who you are matches with who you are. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, I think that, you know, the, the idea here being that, first of all, you, if you're someone who's kind of leaning into this idea of creating thought leadership content, that you're consistent with it. Um, Olga, I think you're a great example of that. You're a prolific content creator and people get to know you through your content. Um, they get to uh, gain an understanding that you're an expert in the various issues that you create content around. And I think every, Every prolific thought leader um, experience, experiences that same instance where um, people who are consuming your content and following you start to um, develop a, almost a bond and a relationship with you on a deeper level than they would otherwise. Um, and, and how, though, to go about that? I like to think about it in terms of think about you know, the last great nonfiction business book you read. Um, for example, let's think about a book by Malcolm Gladwell, um, who many people are, would be familiar with. Um, his storytelling structure in his books, and I think we can all agree Malcolm Gladwell is a thought leader in his space, um, very, follows a pretty predictable pattern. Um, he, he tells a story at the beginning of each chapter of, of every book. Um, and then he goes on to support, use that story as an entry point into discussing some more substantive topic. So for him, it's oftentimes telling a story which relates to an academic study that he's come across that he wants to expand upon. And then wrapping up that chapter with some key takeaways for the audience. Um, so I think if we think in terms of how do we create a perception um, uh, among our audience that matches who we are as an expert and as a professional, it's about one, understanding our audience and what they want, B, being consistent with the creation of our thought, uh, thought leadership content, and, and C, using storytelling and other devices to be persuasive and sort of along those same guidelines I discussed. Start with a story, grab people on an emotional basis, hook them into what you're trying to say, then sort of deliver the logic and reason behind that and why that story is relevant to them, and then provide them with some key takeaways so that they can benefit from your experience. So in a real simple way, one, two, three, it's here's what happened either to me or someone else. Here's what... I learned and, and you can learn from this experience. And then here's how to benefit from that in the future. So I think if we follow that sort of formula and thinking in terms of um, how do I convey my expertise on a consistent basis using some of these devices, um, you'll be successful in terms of shaping perceptions. Yeah, I, I find that folks definitely want to know how the sausage has been made. Mm -hmm. Um, and they want to be part of that kind of, as you say, emotional journey and know how you felt and worked through that. Um, I also, you know, um, historically, I, I, I've started with sort of, hey, this is my expertise and let me share it. Uh, but I've also, you know, because I, I've pivoted a few times, I've also used those conversations to actually continue learning and be very open that there are some things that I'm still learning and I am talking to folks and and actually that's a process of learning and that attracts more people into your life. 
Uh, so you can kind of you can you can be, be an expert and share your expertise, or you can be very open about, hey, I'm a newcomer, but um, open to conversations, and then you attract experts to teach you and everybody else. Um, and that's a really kind of great way to build community around that as well. Um, we have a hi Na Nanopa. Thank you for asking a question. This is a really actually great question um, around. Um, you know, expertise sometimes um, can be, I don't know, threatening maybe, um, mm -hmm. just a little. Um, and, uh, you know, you definitely want to have an expertise so folks, you know, so you can influence. But then on the other hand, um, you want to see eye to eye and, and, and be at their level. Um, and I guess it's sort of curious, and I think you touched a little bit on, 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 on this. How do you ultimately get to the place of influence where you're seeing people eye to eye, where it's less about talking up, down, but more conversational uh, and inclusive and inviting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is something that comes with uh, with time and, and confidence. And frankly, it sort of seems counterintuitive, but I think that when we're maybe feeling a little bit insecure about ourselves, that's sometimes when we come across as someone who's not genuine. And because we're we're never um, showing any weakness or vulnerability whatsoever. Um, and I think that's a big mistake. I think if you look at most, you know, quote, experts um, who have reached a certain level of um, credibility with an audience, they're very much um, expressing vulnerability and, and, and telling people when they don't know something. I, I don't, I think that an important part of thought leadership, frankly, is, is expressing that. I think that one of the roles of a thought leader is not to talk at people, but to catalyze conversations around issues, which to your point, Olga, I think you were just making, which is build community, um, understand and, and, and have, um, you know, enough, uh, self-awareness that you don't know everything and that you have a lot to learn still. And I think it's, it's, it's certainly okay. It's frankly advisable to reveal some of that when creating content or building your brand, because no one's going to trust anyone who suggests that they know everything. I mean, we've all come across those types of people and they're not the type of people we want to follow. Um, and, and I think that's key, but that does come with, a, it, it's sort of paradox, paradoxical, but you sort of have to have a certain level of confidence in order to, uh, admit that you don't know everything. But once you reach that point, then, you know, your, your persuasiveness goes up because you have greater credibility, I think. Um, so it's okay. Be vulnerable. Um, ask questions, admit when you don't know something. Um, you know, I think that's an evolution as of a thought leader. Yeah, I also find it helpful to admit that like the Olga today will be different than Olga tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and that community is a fluid thing. Um, that no one owns a community really, um, and uh, it, folks come and go, and they stay because there is something of value to them. Uh, whatever that may be, whether it's education, entertainment, both, or something else, connections, um, and and having this the, this this view of and comfort of fluidity um, and understanding that the community changes and you may change as well. Um, I find that to be incredibly helpful and, 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 and really allows uh, all the participants to be propelled forward. Um, you, you mentioned one framework of the sort of the hook with a story, with a research uh, that kind of um, provides some data and sort of marrying the storytelling with the logic and and, mm -hmm. and, and data to back it up and sort of driving the point. Are there any other frameworks um, when you do storytelling that, are, that is helpful uh, for folks to think about um, as they're thinking to present kind of their personal stories and, and their expertise as they're packaging um, this material into digestible chunks? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important framework uh, is the, the, the first step, which is, understanding your audience with, with real clarity. Um, and, and that involves, you know, I guess, picking an audience, right? I mean, I think that effective storytellers tend to kind of own or, or be part of an, a niche space um, because that way, that's the only way to really get to know 
who the audience is that you're trying to communicate with. So really being clear, not trying to be everything to everyone, but trying to be really relevant to a particular group of people. And once you have that understanding, you can have a better understanding of what they want, right? Your job, I mean, if you think about, there's a there's a framework that Donald Miller, who's the founder of um, StoryBrand, who some of you may be familiar with, talks about how using story to um, do effective marketing. And he talks about the role of, you know, say a, a professional, a lawyer, is not, not to position themselves as the hero of the story, not to talk about all the accolades and credentials that you might have, but rather as the guide who's helping your client, who is the hero of their own story. And so if we can think in those terms, what we really need to do is once we understand who our audience is, understanding what our audience wants and our role in helping guide them to where they want to go. Um, and that then can help us to identify um, through that understanding, what are the pain points they're dealing with? What are the challenges they're facing? And if you're sort of staying in your lane, you'll notice the patterns and, and connect the dots between the types of questions clients are asking you, the interactions you're having on social media, and you can craft your storytelling and your thought leadership content in a much more effective way that's contextualized for your audience. So the framework really is know your audience, understand what they want, understand the pain points and challenges they face, and you as the content creator can then address that through your content and be seen as the guide to help them get where they want to go. Yeah, yeah, I that, that, that is so important. Remember the community is a fluid thing. And asking that question often um, is, is probably a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and also asking, um, are you still swimming in the right swim lane? Mm -hmm. um, also a very important thing because you will be changing as well um, because series of interactions result in change on both sides on the, on the, on the side of a quote unquote expert and the quote unquote community. Let's talk about stories. You know, sometimes stories are personal um, and we can kind of selectively decide how much to share and from what point of view. Um, and sometimes we want to tell stories of others mm -hmm. uh, because um, either because they're better stories um, because they're not so personal or because they're actually better fitting story for the point we're trying to make. How do you think about which stories to tell, how much to reveal, and, um, and in the end, whether to even use any given story? That's a great question. And, and one, I'm glad you brought up the point because I was going to bring it up anyway, which was it doesn't always have to be our own stories that we tell. Um, but... And I'll get to that in a moment um, and what that means. Uh, but when, when thinking about it, you know, I think it's really a matter of um, kind of going back through our own personal experiences as it relates to some of the stories that have been formative in our own experiences um, and, and identifying those and, and seeing what is, you know, who are the people, what are the events, what are the um, implications of what's happened to me in the past that, that has informed who I am today and thinking about, can I build some stories and content around those issues? Because the key there is, yes, the story needs to be interesting, but it also needs to have a point that's relevant to the audience that you're trying to reach. Because again, you're, you are telling your story, but it's really about kind of creating a framework in which other people can, can sort of see through that lens that you are um, holding up their own story and their own struggles and their own experience. And that's what allows them to sort of resonate with what you're trying to communicate. Um, on the other hand, we can pick stories about other people. Just a, an example um, from my own experience, one of the more popular posts that I created on, um, on LinkedIn in the last 12 months was a story about John Grisham and how when he decided he wanted to write his first novel, he'd get up at five in the morning and rush into the office and write furiously on a legal pad and try to get 500 words done each morning before he had to go to court. Um, and, you know, how that sort of experience led him through, you know, sticking with it through years to ultimately become a, you know, a best-selling author. Um, that really resonated with people. Um, and that was not my story. It was his because people, again, many people have that same aspiration as someone like John Grisham. So that was the perfect story to tell in that context. Um, now, when it comes to our own personal stories, you know, how personal to get, it's, it's a fine line, I think. Um, you know, we want to be authentic, but maybe not <laughs> overly authentic if it means that we're going to generate too much controversy or um, maybe cast ourselves in a negative light. I mean, we have to all use our judgment here. I don't want to 
try to suggest, and uh, you know, censoring anyone or anyone being too cautious when it comes to storytelling and content creation. Because I think many people go too far in the opposite direction, which is not being nearly authentic and vulnerable enough. But you know, it's it's really thinking in terms of what's happened to me in the past. What stories do I have to tell that can help inform, educate, and perhaps entertain other people? That's kind of the metric or the barometer that I like to think about. Um, yeah, I'm with you that most people actually have the sort of not the problem of too much information. There are a few folks who do, mm -hmm. but majority of folks are just um, end up speaking in generalities and not enough specificity um, that it's less of a story. It's kind of a, a, a diluted version of the story and it's, it's not as engaging. Um, the way I tend to think of it is, you know, say you have a picture of an elephant, right? You want to take a picture of an elephant. You know, you can take pictures of kind of from the trunk. You can do a side view. You can do kind of more from behind. I think there are many ways to be authentic in presenting an elephant. And the way um, you do it, it just really depends on the kind of story you want to convey. Sometimes, you know, it's all about the trunk and sometimes it's more about the ears and the tail. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the size of the foot. Um, all of those are true and authentic stories. Um, if they're told with enough specificity and details and engagement, um, but you can kind of decide whether or not trunk should be part of the story. It doesn't make it any less true or authentic. It's just not the focus. Um, and that's frankly, you know, I'm, I'm a trained artist, you know, when, when, when you decide, for example, how to draw a portrait of someone, uh, you very much decide the vintage point of view and, and, and the focus and, and the light. And, and, and it's, and, and, you know, we're three dimensional objects. You can't show everything in two dimensional world. So you unavoidably have to include and exclude things. And that's just sort of part of visual or verbal storytelling, it doesn't make it less authentic. It's just, it just makes it an editorial choice. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have to be uh, conscious enough and not be asleep behind the wheel. But I am with you that majority of people are not telling the story, but sort of giving you either a punchline right away or um, so worried about revealing too much that, that there is really no story. Having said that, I personally, because, you know, some of the stories that happen to me more often than not is basically stories of my family and my, my family, my kids specifically are a lot more private than I am. Um, and for the longest time, I actually have not shared about my children or even uh, shared their pictures on social media. They're now of age where I can actually ask them permission and how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, because um, I do think that when they grow up, it's, it's their story to tell. Uh, though I may have a point of view. So depending on how much you reveal, how much specificity and who is involved, I do think that it's, it's worthy to protect the privacy and, um, and preferences of folks that are loved in your life. Um, if, if you are revealing who they are with enough specificity that folks can identify them, maybe even ask for permission. Um, and then there's stories of third parties that are famous that you have uncovered, you know, just like John Grisham story. Um, this is probably a pretty well known story, just maybe not known by everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's a very different story. So I think you yeah, have, have to think of it as the degree of stories and whose story is it and has it been told and has it been told in public. And then you sort of ask appropriate questions of how to, to reveal it. Um, we're coming to the end and I definitely want to sort of ask you to give parting words to the audience about storytelling. But before we do, I, I also want to talk about context because the story you tell on social media versus the story you tell when you pitch your business versus the story you tell when you fundraise may be different. Um, and so I'm just curious, Jay, how you think about the context of telling a story. There are different um, stories and ways you're telling stories depending on the context of the, of the situation. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it, it, the interesting thing, and I think the way everyone should think about this is you see that you see people and brands who are very effective at telling stories sort of have, have a, I'll call it an arsenal of stories at, at the ready. Um, they've gone, they've been very strategic about thinking about what are the appropriate stories to be telling um, based on the, the context of the situation they're in. So, um, you know, Olga, you'd probably 
be able to speak to this more effectively. But I think every you know every founder um, is probably advised to talk about you know the the ups and downs, the struggles of the of the business, perhaps, and how those things have been overcome and. And that's part of, you know, an effective pitch to a to VC to show, look, we're a resilient group here who, who's able to overcome, um, you know, challenges that are inevitable moving forward. And we're someone who are, would be good stewards of your investment. Um, that That's a story that I think is appropriate for that context. So it's something you need to be thinking about in advance. Um, depending on, you know, if you're a professional who's trying to, to pitch a client, it might be a very different story. Um, and it depends to an extent. I mean, I find the more content you share into the marketplace, the more thought leadership and um, expertise that you put out into the into the marketplace of ideas, the more the conversations that flow from that content become about you and not necessarily your expertise. You've, you've already sort of established yourself as an expert. And at that point, those business development conversations become about you as a person to a greater extent, what it would be like to work with you, Again, whether you're someone who um, the prospective client um, would enjoy working with, feels like they can trust, um, not necessarily for what you know, but like just is that is that um, is that vibe or or uh, relationship been established enough between the two parties? So so that that might be where you're talking more about your you know your upbringing, your backstory, your family, your values, that kind of thing. Um, and, and telling those stories. So it really depends. It does depend on the context. But I think we all should think about some of our core stories that make us who we are and be ready to tell those in the various contexts in which we find ourselves. Yeah, I find it. Um, I, I once, a few years ago, I did a TEDx talk and um, I had a coach. Um, the, the, the TEDx San Francisco gave me a coach. She was, she was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead of she, she, instead of, I was thinking how, you know, what points I convey. And she said, Olga, actually just go ahead and, and, and forget about what you want to say. Just whatever stories that you think make up you. Mm -hmm. uh, because then once you have the authentic stories of who you are, it's easier to look back and connect them than mm -hmm. to actually kind of hope that your stories connect a certain way. Um, so backing into my stories, actually writing them all down or enough of them down, and then doing the overarching kind of uh, story backwards was very helpful. Um, and that sort of gave a framework going forward where additional stories as, as they arrive or as I finally remember them, um, they sort of fit in somewhere on that arch of, of, of the actual epic, right? Um, and uh, I find that, that, that to be a very helpful exercise. Uh, it takes a while to do it. It's not a one or twi two time thing. It's something you kind of do over time. But um, at some point, we are all collection of stories, either stories that have been told about us or stories that we tell about ourselves. And depending what kind of stories we tell to ourselves, about ourselves, to others, uh, we are shaping our future. Jay, this has been a very uh, interesting conversation. I, I've learned a lot from you. I would love for you to give parting words to the audience and uh, so that um, they focus their thought leadership and their storytelling in a way that would be fruitful. And especially um, for those folks who are in the house, I uh, would love for you to give specific suggestions uh, to 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 in-house uh, legal practitioners. Just a few tips um, to to think about. One is you know just embracing the notion that you know even if you um, are a little hesitant to tell stories, understand that you're that's what your audience wants. We're all sort of hardwired through evolutionary biology to both create and consume stories. So it's it's the means in which we communicate, um, create memories, uh, process information. We do it through story. So. Um, you know, to the extent you're you're hesitant, just understand that's the thing your audience wants. So I would encourage you to experiment with it a little bit. Um, in doing so, you know, one of the things that I see people struggle with when it comes to storytelling is it, when when they're starting to think about telling stories, is they want to give the whole memoir at once, um, and that's not the way to approach things. Um, think in terms of the smallest, you know, kind of micro lens possible. Um, Anne Lamott, the author, talks about looking through a one inch you know, picture frame. We want to hear like the discrete nuggets of what makes up your experience um, to inform, you know, the story and the lesson you're trying to tell. So, so think small, keep it simple. Um, and then 
one one last kind of overarching thought would be um, even if you don't have much experience, um, you still have stories to tell and expertise to share. Um, for example, you know, if you're a second year lawyer in a law firm, um, you don't know as much about you know the the, the practice of law necessarily as a senior partner in your firm, almost certainly, but you have more expertise than that person in any number of areas. One of which is what it's like to be a first year lawyer or a law student. You're much closer to that experience. So that's an audience that you can communicate to and you can share expertise in a way that someone who has much more legal experience can't. So don't be afraid to tell stories and share thought leadership for the appropriate point in your career. Um, so th those are just a couple of things, Olga. Um, for for in-house people, I might say, um, you know, look for opportunities to use storytelling and thought leadership to change um, behavior, culture, and drive initiatives within your company, and and make storytelling an important part of that. Jay, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your expertise, um, and um, I love your advice of micro lenses. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can present an elephant from many angles um, and, um, and, and definitely tell that story over time. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.